those of you who are RSVP'd, obviously were asked to fill out a survey here to talk about how the L train shutdown would have and will affect you, and, and uh, we've got some results here. Have you been affected by the L train shutdown change of plans? 60% no, 40% yes. On the, on the one hand, I'm glad that most of you have not. On the other hand, 40% is a really high number for a non-event. Um, so that's really sort of, uh, and, and, and Toby and I were talking about this beforehand, about the changes to, to local residents, to business owners here, who made preemptive plans for a shutdown that has not happened, and, uh, and we'll get to some of that. Um, this came up a lot today in the workshop, which I'll ask Rodrigo to talk about. Um, the lack of trust in the MTA and other city agencies in handling of this. Um, if you see this, I mean, one way of looking at this is that uh, one third of people thought it was okay how they handled it, and two thirds of it thought it was mostly terrible in terms of how, bad to terrible in terms of how uh, the shutdown has been managed. Um, other slides here, I thought this was interesting today. This came up a lot in our workshop as well in terms of a breakdown of uses. Um, you know. Uh, you know, again, thinking about when we think mostly about how we use the subways and use the MTA here, we think about daily commutes. Um, one of the big themes that came up, particularly in my group discussion, was about the fact that, like, you know, Williamsburg and Greenpoint have a lot of weekend and nighttime users. That the peak here is very different than just sort of a business district peak of Midtown or downtown. So that 33%, my weekend plans depend on the L, is quite significant in this. Um, and, you know, and, and it is interesting that 46% of, you know, basically of you, those of you here tonight sort of shrugged. Um, you know, I'm from Queens, so I guess I'd be part of that. Um, but still, it raises questions about what is a peak commute and what is a non-peak commute. Um, this is perhaps the most interesting survey results of all. 10% uh, of you are creating your own jetpack. I would encourage you to apply to cohort six. Um, that's gonna be a great urban tech. 4% um, moved to a different area. That obviously got a lot of the most attention here, the notion of like people who are disrupting their life plans, moving to other neighborhoods, even other cities. 39% um, fell back you know, on the idea of what the MTA would tell you to do, which is to basically look at uh, other routes, other substitute service, the fact that adding capacity on the M and other lines on the G, um, and that you, know, you can get around this despite the fact that there's obvious trade-offs in time. Um, I thought the most interesting perhaps was 8% substitute with ferries. Obviously our mayor is infatuated with ferries and I know some of the local community stakeholders wanted to push more on ferries. It's very interesting to see that only 8% here, uh, despite you know, the actual gorgeous luxury of our ferries, um, were less interested than they were in buses, which I feel get a bad rap. If you know, if you follow transportation closely, you know that bus ridership in New York is declining and declining around the country. So it's, I thought 19% was quite high. 5% substitute with shuttle private services. As Benjamin and I were discussing beforehand, it's fascinating that like basically Cuomo announced the changes to the plan and then Chariot went out of business like the next day. Um, so you know we saw that these private mobility micro transit services did not get as much traction as they thought. Uh, and then with 14%, which did not come up at the workshop, but we have Phil here from Lime, um, you know, the notion of, of using all these new micro mobility services, which are sweeping across America, except here in New York, uh, for various- uh, We're working on that. Yeah, you're definitely working on that. Uh, and the 1% I don't know. Uh, we've got about 100 people here. Who doesn't know? Anyone, any raise of hands? Okay, that person did not come tonight. Um, so we'll get into these various modes of what it says. All right, so with that, I'll introduce my panelists here. And I'm um, so to my immediate uh, left here, this is Phil Jones, who's the East Coast Senior Director at Lime. Uh, Lime, of course, is one of the micromobility startups that just raised, was it $300 million, $2.4 billion valuation, so the unicorns of micromobility. To his immediate left is Toby Moskowitz, who is the CEO at Heritage Equity Partners, owners of the Williamsburg Hotel, among others in that. Uh, to her left is uh, Benjamin Solitaire, who's a community organizer, North Brooklyn Director of Participatory Budgeting and Council, my council member Stephen Levin, who's speaking in a personal capacity tonight, he wants to let you know. Uh, and then to his left is Rodrigo Batista from the Forum of the Future, Forum for the Future, uh, who led the workshop uh, that we hosted here this afternoon. And then finally at the end, battling illness, who joined us, uh, is Kate Slevin, who's the Senior Vice President at the Regional Plan Association, um, who worked for Jeanette City Con, our former Transportation Commissioner. Uh, and of course, if you know the RPA, they have in the fourth regional plan that came out last fall some very definite thoughts on how to restructure the subways overall. So can I get an early round of applause for all of our panelists? I have my wine. Thank you, Phil. All right. So as a first question, because we have a we have a large and a wheelie panel, so we'll get into this. But I guess first first question for Rodrigo. So you're actually for the here for the second part of the program. We had an invitation only workshop here today with public officials, uh, technologists, a uh, whole sort of group here to think and game game out. You know how we can sort of mitigate the sort of slow motion uh, shutdown of the L train that's going to happen now. And so Rodrigo, could you quickly walk us through sort of the outcome of that workshop and, and you know did we did we manage to save the L as we know it? 
great question. <laughs> now, I don't, I don't think we're quite there yet, but, I, but what I, I will share from the conversation we had, it was, uh, so a little bit about us, Forum, we're an NGO focused on sustainability and system change, and when we're thinking about sustainability, it's economic, social, and also uh, environmental issues. Um, the reason why we brought all these different actors together is just to really imagine how can we mitigate, but also understand and grab it as an opportunity, what is happening today to really improve the lives of uh, people that are living in these neighborhoods, but also actually think a little bit longer term rather than just the immediate issue. And some of the, what we did, three things. We understand the new plan. We really, uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to hear official news pretty soon of what the new plan is. Uh, we understand the new plan a little bit better, but still then we start to identify and make analysis in terms of the implications. And some of the challenges that we heard are things that probably are very familiar to, to you and some of the things that Greg was just mentioning. So this element of trust, when things were essentially playing in one plan and then changes, how decisions are taken and the transparency around those decisions and the importance of, for us to understand how those decisions are taken. Particularly from my perspective, I, I have design background. And I think participatory design in terms of how these type of decisions are implemented is key. And the community in the previous uh, original plan was actually really consulted a few times, different times in order to take the decision of what things uh, could, could have been done. No? Where actually one of the questions there was, shall we do a shutdown or shall we do an intermittent kind of service like what we have now? And the community actually chose back then in those meetings to say, let's get it done. No? And that was part of the, the process that, that initially was the original plan. So there's a question there about how do you integrate that, how transparency is, is done. And uh, I think the, the other element that we were uh, discussing a lot and was part of the final bit is like integration of data and using this as an opportunity to different modes of transport that are low carbon emission, that are thinking about connecting us in a different way to really rethink how we move and why we move. And I think that's a key element. We, we tend to give for granted like trying to move from A to B, but actually asking the question why we move is also quite essential in building that new system that where sometimes you don't have to actually commute from uh, Brooklyn to Manhattan when you can do your work here. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So that's a little bit of what we what we discuss. Ways of defining accessibility. Well, Benjamin, I'll go to you, and then Toby, of course. And I'd love to hear the two of you talk on this about you know the transparency and community engagement of this. And you know, one of the big themes I mentioned that came up today was sort of you know that came up in all the workshops was how sort of the the collapse in trust in the MTA and and basically sort of how this process has been handled. And um and the fact also the fact that you know we did a workshop today to come up with the you know how do we leverage this sort of fizzled crisis into new opportunities um, underscores the fact that like there were plans to have new opportunities. There was, a, there was going to be the sort of don't let a crisis go to waste and now we're back to, well, we're number one, so why try harder? We'll just fix it and then we'll just move on as we were before. And, um, and there were a lot of interesting plans and ideas of like how we could basically use this uh, as a springboard to improve that. So Benjamin, I was hoping you could talk a bit about that first, I guess, because you're a workshop participant and I'd love to hear Toby's thoughts too about the community and organizing to, to pressure this about how we want to define our mobility ecosystem. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it was a great workshop today. I was glad to be part of that. Um, I guess everybody knows, you know, the, the plans for shutting down the, the L have been around for uh, a couple of years. Uh, there was a community discussion about what to do. Uh, the decision was to shut it down for 15 or 18 months at that point. Um, and then there was a lot of, uh, I'll, I guess we'll leave it up for discussion if there was a lot of community engagement, but there was community engagement and lots of discussions about what the plans were going to be. And they were going to, um, you know, they weren't possibly 100% perfect, but there was a lot of good thoughts. There was increased ferry service. There was SBS with HOV lanes. We've grown the bike lanes. We've grown the city bike. Um, you know, we were looking at, at micro-mobility uh, transportation methods. So um, there was a lot of work that was going to be done that could have potentially stayed around after and improved the situation overall. Uh, that um, the community worked for, the L-Train Coalition, and members throughout Brooklyn and Manhattan. And now, uh, you know, I want to say the MTA was not fully part of the decision to change this. Um, it just happened, as you know. Cuomo had a press conference one day, and I think a lot of us found out about what was happening on that day. 
uh, along with uh, a lot of people that I've worked with over the years. So um, they are now adapting to that. It is great that the L train will not shut down for the majority for that length completely. Um, but there still is a, a lot of questions to be answered. Um, at this moment, the plans, uh, the, the alternative transportation plans, are not, you know, they're not reaching for the stars, they're not reaching for new ideas. They're trying to solve this problem that they have spent three years on and now they're trying to fix in three months. Um, they may be adequate, but they're not gonna expand the system and they're not gonna benefit us in a long-term situation that we were hoping to see. And I must say we were fully there with the old plan, but we were getting there. So, um, you know, we, we have a few months to go. We have 15 to 18 months of actual work to be done. So I think we need to really take that opportunity get back out there. We want the MTA, they've promised some community meetings. I think they should happen now. They should happen more frequently, not just uh, two or so per, per borough. But we need to hear from you guys and we need to push them a little farther uh, on making some plans that would really be long-term positive for New York City. Toby, could you expand a bit about that? Sure. So um, I don't know how many of you know the name Felice Kirby. I, she, I know she was here earlier She's today. joined us earlier yes. today. So, um, you know, I am not a natural community activist. I'm a real estate developer. I'm also a single mom, so I don't have a, a lot of time. Um, I, you know, own and operate the Williamsburg Hotel um, and 25 Kent. And I heard Felice speak maybe like six years ago, and she told the story of the Williamsburg Bridge. And I don't know how many of you know that, I think it was in the late 80s, the city needed uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to repair the Williamsburg Bridge. And they said, well, why don't we just rip it down? Because nobody uses it. And Felice was a young woman then, and she basically organized this whole effort and reversed that decision. And I think the roots of community activism in this neighborhood, which includes people in the nonprofit industry, working for government, um, business owners. Felice um, owns a bar for many years, which uh, she sold and is a real estate owner in the neighborhood, um, started from there. You know, I'm sure everybody knows the story of what happened with Bushwick Inlet Park and a very sophisticated effort to pressure the city to come up with the money to buy that missing piece of the park. Um, and I think I've been, you know, it was honored to witness, Felice was one of the first people to step up with, with the L Train Coalition. You know, with Benjamin, we hosted many of these meetings at the Williamsburg Hotel. Um, and what I would say is I think it was a phenomenal effort and somebody in our community is probably the person, we think it's Bill Harvey, he hasn't admitted to it, who accosted the governor on the subway, if you know the story um, that got us to this point, but there was a very aggressive, unified effort that forced the MTA to take the neighborhood seriously, and that starts with North Williamsburg all the way down the L train. Um, I do think it's critical that everybody in this audience who hasn't participated call Benjamin and find out what you could do to be part of this, because we always need new recruits to help push that voice. There are a lot of changes that we would have liked to see with regard to ferry service, bus service, and other parts of transportation that are broken in this neighborhood, which we don't want to have fall through the wayside now that this, you know, we'll, we'll call it things have pivoted. Um, but the other thing that I think is worth mentioning is that as hard as we worked as a community, clearly we didn't ask the right questions because we focused only on solutions and we took it for granted that this was, there was a sophisticated professional effort that went into choosing a vendor, deciding on how to go about the repairs, and clearly that wasn't the case, and we still don't have real transparency on why those decisions were made, how that vendor was selected, who I understand now is the same company that screwed up the Second Avenue subway. Um, and if the governor could come out from, after a three-week effort, and you know, I have friends who moved away from the neighborhood. You know, the guys who own the matcha bar in White Avenue, they shut their business down. You know, people made real serious life-changing decisions on a bit, effectively a plan that none of us understand what was before. We certainly don't understand what's going on now. I hope to God that there's not another announcement that now the L train, in fact, has to be shut down because you know we need to take this activism to the next level, whether it's somebody, you know. I'd love to read those emails between the MTA and this vendor to understand what really happened, but you know, giving us a more effective explanation as to why that repair and the full shutdown was necessary, why it's no longer necessary, and what's really going on. Because these, this really affects the lives and businesses of millions of people that are passing through, through our community. And I think that's critical. I'll throw out one last thing. Is this being televised? Uh, Is this being recorded? Being recorded? So, uh, 
So I'll just say that I won't tell you who said it because he asked me not to repeat it from him, but a friend of ours, Benjamin knows, um, like a couple of years ago floated a conspiracy theory and he basically said, and I think he said this publicly, but I'm not going to quote him, that the MTA is a shareholder in Hudson Yards and we should look at the impact of the L train on Brooklyn and what happened with Hudson Yards and the tenants that went there. So I'm not a conspiracy theorist. There's a lot of you know, there are, I have, we all have a lot of questions. And I think right now what needs to happen is the community of Williamsburg and the communities of North Brooklyn along the L train deserve real information about what is being done to fix our subway, what was supposed to happen two months ago, what's gonna happen now, and we need to be part of the solution conversation as to the repairs, not just the mitigation conversation which Benjamin, again, you can call me, but he's smarter than I am, and he actually has real access yeah. at Councilman Levin's office. Well, as I was say, at our, our last event here at Urban X, we had, uh, we had Bianca Wiley from uh, Tech Reset Canada, and she's definitely a Dan Doctoroff conspiracy theorist. So this is now our second Hudson Yards <laughs> conspiracy theory tie-in. Um, I want to go... I want to go to Kate next on this one because uh, you know those of you who know the, the RPA, the Regional Plan Association, uh, you know publishes it's once little once in a generation the regional plan, long term thinking about what should be done, and the fourth regional plan published last fall had a very lengthy discussion about how do we fix the subways, how we should rethink the entire system of that. And also in that, I should note my connection to it, I was part of, a, of an exercise the RPA sponsored with teams of architects um, to rethink uh, and visual, uh, uh, visualize the region. And, and so I was part of a team that visualized the coast of New York and New Jersey in 2067, which I then leveraged as part of a presentation of the Port Authority where, I, where they were thinking about the Hudson. What happens to how we increase capacity through the Hudson tunnels by 2040? And I asked the question there is, what if we don't increase them at all? Or what if you build a new tunnel and then the next superstorm, Sandy, knocks it out. I mean, it's been seven years almost, it'll be six and a half years, since Sandy caused the damage that we are still battling to mitigate and repair uh, on the L train. And, and you know, we know with climate change happening that this will perhaps only get worse or more frequent. Um, so okay, with that sort of setup, because the RPA also included discussions of sea level rise and really sort of grappled with these long-term questions. Um, I'm curious, you know, like what is this, how much of the harbinger is the L train for what we could expect between now and say, you know, the next regional plan in 2050 or so, given the release dates? Um, well, I'll, I'll start by saying the uh, recommendation in our fourth regional plan, we had about 61 recommendations in there and it's really, really a dense website. Um, it's not a book yet, but it will be one day. Um, the one that got the biggest headline was we recommended closing the subways at night. And the reason we did that wasn't because we hate the subways or we hate people who ride the subways at night or anything like that. It was because we think the subways are in such bad shape and it's going to be so expensive to fix them that we just recommended just tearing the bandage off um, and saying, okay, well, we can fix it in you know, a fraction of the time at a fraction of the cost if we actually have longer work windows underground when people can go down, do the work they have to do, and they don't have to bring all their equipment back up every morning. Um, uh, uh, or, you know, they only have a four-hour window at night for which to work. So we recommended that. It got a lot of headlines. We were called, you know, idiots who didn't understand New York and all this stuff like that. Um, but I think the reason we got very involved in the L train discussion early on was because we saw it as a way to test out this idea that if you actually close this as, uh, as a line down for a longer period of time, maybe you can get a lot of the improvements that would otherwise be done over a decade done in a year. And I don't know about you all, but after riding subways in the city, you've seen for a long time, you've seen them decline over the past four to five years. Um, I have two kids, one is eight, one is um, four. When I had the eight-year-old, everyone stood up on the subway for me when I was pregnant. When I had the four-year-old, no one did, because no one could see me because it was too damn crowded on that train. Um, so basically, we, we, we saw this and we said, this can't happen, we have, we have to have our transit system functioning. Um, so we were very involved. We made a recommendation for um, mitigation plan during the shutdown. Um, we made a recommendation that the shutdown happen. Um, and we worked a lot with uh, folks on this um, panel and a lot of the community members in the neighborhood and a lot of the elected officials um, to ensure that the mitigation plan was robust and provided a really good um, alternative for people um, who are um, who would be not have a service um, for a period of you know at that time I think it was longer than 15 months right 18 months um, and you know a lot of those recommendations were actually adopted by the MTA and went into their final mitigation plan 
And so we had this change of direction now, and part of the reason we liked the mitigation plan um, was because it actually created something we really don't have much of in New York, which is a transit way on 14th Street. And that is something other cities do, no problem. You go to Europe, there's a transit way in the downtown. You go to even Denver, you go all over the place. They have streets that are prioritized for buses, for um, pedestrians, for bikes, and not for cars. And we have very few of those. We have one in downtown Brooklyn, and I think that's pretty much it um, across the city. So we really wanted to get a couple of those models of how to rethink street space moving forward because we know that we have to fix the subways. In order to fix the subways, you need a, a, better, serv a better service above ground. Um, so essentially, that's kind of, these are some of the, the things that were in the near term. We really saw the L train as a way to test out some of these ideas that we're increasingly going to have to do across the system in order to fix the transit system. Um, and so, you know, I think right now, um, we're actually hoping that a lot of the mitigation measures will still be considered by the MTA in the city. They recently said they're not going to do the transitway on 14th Street. They're not going to do the HOV lanes on the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, and they might not do some of the bike improvements that ha they had promised. And I think that's a real missed opportunity. Um, you know, it's, we have this moment in time when there are all these plans developed, and if we don't go forward with them, we're not going to understand how people feel about buses, how people really feel about really solid, um, uh, uh, better uh, transit options above ground. Um, and part of the reason that bus service is ridership is declining is because it gets stuck in the same traffic that the cars do, and it's not reliable. You have to wait forever, and we have to fix that. We absolutely have to fix that. We can't just rely on the subways. They're going to be kind of a mess for a long time if we're going to fix them. Um, so I'll move on to the climate change question because I know that's I'm going on for too long. Um, so part of the reason the L train needed to be shut down was because of um, the effects of Superstorm Sandy. The same was the case in the Hudson Tunnels. Those are the tunnels that connect New Jersey um, to New York and go into Penn Station. They are also in a moment where they're seeing decline and they are gonna need to be shut down at some point soon. We're gonna be releasing a report about that and the potential impacts of that on the region um, next week. So please keep an eye out for that. It's not pretty um, uh, and it won't be good for people who own real estate in New Jersey um, because the 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 problems are going to be severe, and there's no plan to build a new tunnel, which is something you'd have to do um, before you shut that tunnel down. So the sea level rise maps that we've put out, you can take a look on our website and the fourth plan. I mean, a lot of the connections between our region are going to be severely impacted. The whole area of Secaucus, one to two foot of sea level rise, will be permanently flooded. And this is not just like sea level rise during storms or storm surge during storms. It's permanent, um, and that you can you can kind of deal with the effects of storm surge. It's much harder to deal with the effects of permanent flooding, um, and and I think it's something like two million people across the region. And we don't just cover New York City; we cover northern New Jersey and parts of Connecticut, Long Island, Hudson Valley as well. Um, two, two million people in that region will see this permanent flooding in where they live, and that doesn't include um, uh, hospitals, uh, public housing. Um, and a variety of other infrastructure we absolutely need. Um, so I don't know if... Thank you. We'll, we'll come back to that. We're going to really... Yourself, what time frame is that happening? Uh, we estimate, like, you don't, we don't exactly know. Um, I think the three foot, one foot could happen as soon as 30 years from now. Um, six feet um, would be into the beginning of next century. Um, but a lot of these transportation investments... They take time and they take a lot of money, and those are two things. You know, we don't have a lot of transportation well, money. Yeah, right we'll, now. Come, we'll come back to that in the context of L-Train. I'll come back to you, Rodrigo. But I would say we haven't asked Phil yet, and 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 Kate's discussion there got into a lot of it with the notion of, of the you know basically the transit way and the fact that like again New York, while we grapple with these issues, scooters and bicycles and micro mobility has taken the world by storm. I was at the micro mobility conference in San Francisco last month. And you know discussions of trillion dollar trillion dollar opportunity and the ability to replace you know hundreds of millions of kilometers of of of, of auto uh, miles traveled vehicle miles traveled, and uh, and one of the big themes that came up in the discussion today a lot of the final discussions were about if we can't 
build massive new capacity on the trains, we're going to have to do a better job of in integrating all modes of mobility into the system. And uh, to which my response was, well, let's find the ones that aren't currently suing the city. So that would remove Uber and Lyft from that list. But fortunately, we have Lime, which is the next biggest one here. So so Phil, I know, I know, yeah, if you could talk a bit about Lime, I know the, the city has you guys sort of uh, uh, constrained a little bit to Staten Island and Far Rockaway, which is going to be one of the first areas hit by climate change, incidentally. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I'm curious, you know, when you hear about these sort of things, and also the last mile discussions where the MTA today uh, you know, talked a bit about us, but like you know, plans to basically you know get people to the G, to the JMZ, to the other lines. I mean, that is a more operable plan. If I can get a scooter, that's I can find it, book it on my app, and then basically take that to a subway station, which is not far when I'm on a scooter versus walkability. So I'm curious what you've what you've learned elsewhere. Sure. Um, so we're currently in Far Rockway and Staten Island, as Greg mentioned, and we're operating about 600 bikes both in both uh, territories. We've done over 95,000 rides with 22,000 unique riders. That tells you that this is not something that's being used for entertainment. It's being used for people to supplement their daily travel needs. And we think that that's something that we can do all over the city. Um, and I bring that to you because we're in current communities where people thought that this type of uh, micromobility would not be sustainable. They are communities that um, have low economic incomes. They're areas that have high public housing, and they're viewed as transit deserts where people would only use these seasonally, right? So um, what we've been able to show is that not only has the community rallied around this form of mobility, it gets them to where they want to go in a timely manner. I have one uh, worker who's in my Sunset Park warehouse. It takes him two and a half hours to get to work if he's taking buses and trains. If he was able to use an e-bike, which we have available, but are currently not uh, operable outside of our pilot zones, it would take him 45 minutes. I think that gives you a real true sense of what's going on here. And if we are able to really give people these opportunities, if we are able to show how this is viable no matter where we are in the city, and we can make it reliable, sustainable, and fun, I think it will revolutionize the multimodal way of viewing the city because we're not grappling with the other bike systems. We're taking people out of cars, because most people who are traveling two to three minutes, they're hopping in a Lyft or an Uber because the buses, as you mentioned, Kate, are unreliable. The subways are shutting down, right? On weekends and overnight. And that's when people are going to work. There are a lot of people in this city who are gonna be affected by this L train shutdown. And most of them are people who are gonna be coming into the city, doing jobs that are off hours or on the weekends, people that we depend on. And what we want to do here at Lime and our other uh, partners in the industry is provide true solutions that can happen immediately. And I think that that's important when we're talking about this. Thank you. All right, so Rodrigo, you wanted to dive in on yeah, this. Yeah, no, I was just thinking about, well, it's just something I've been thinking about uh, recently, and particularly going back to your points, Kate, on the elements of creating a, a solution or repairing the system in a way that is meaningful, more transcendent, and actually thinking long, longer term. And I really start to identify a couple of things, but one of them for me is like, we, we seriously need a paradigm shift. If we keep thinking short term, let's fix it quickly. Uh, it's almost like kind of a, a, a completely probably wrong analogy. It's like, oh, I need a, a liver transplant and I'm going to take an aspirin. So it's how can you actually really create solutions that are going to be thinking for the next 100 years? What, what do we need to, how, how you open new governance governance models that are accountable to the people that live here, the people that actually need to uh, use the, the system in a way that is not thinking from 20th, 20th century almost paradigm or way of thinking like, I, I need results in the next three months because the challenges we have, thinking about climate change, thinking about the sea level rise, are actually going to be affecting us in a much farther way. So I think we have a responsibility and how to shift a paradigm is also part of that. And I really don't know what is the solution around that, but I think if we don't start to think and act differently, things are probably stay very much as, as we have them. 
Yeah, I'd love to hear from Kate and then Toby on this one for two uh, about, about governance and, and sort of activism in this regard because you didn't mention the RPA. I mean, the RPA had an elaborate solution. Like, I mean, I forget what it was called, but you know, you were going to completely reorganize the MTA to create a new corporation to repair the subways. And it was an elaborate governance change in a good way. Um, and then also, Toby, we were discussing beforehand a bit about, you know, like, yeah, what is what is, you know, accountability look like to communities and how do you be involved in the process? And I spent a lot of time with like civic tech crowds about like, how do we create tools that allow community members to peer into these government processes to see what's going on and be involved? But there's other ways of doing that. I mean, there's all sorts of civic activism that goes back decades, obviously. So I don't know, I'd be curious to hear the, the two of you thoughts on very high level and very community level ways of like, how do we get people more involved in this and how do we change the governance model? Yeah, I mean, the MTA hasn't been around forever. It was established in the middle of last century. And, you know, it, it worked for a while. They consolidated a bunch of the agencies that were already operating. And at this point, it's like, well, it's it, there's some things that need to be fixed there. And that's OK. You know, it's OK that it's not perfect. Things have to be changed sometimes to make them better. Um, so we recommended actually separating out um, a new entity that was just focused on fixing the subways. Um, and we recommended that they do it in 15 years. Um, and you know, it's, it's somewhat similar to what Andy Byford, the head of New York City Transit, put out in his fast forward plan, which is a great plan. And we should all be working to get the revenue needed to implement that plan through things like congestion pricing, um, which I'm spending a lot of time on right now. Um, and we absolutely need those new revenue sources first and foremost. And then after we get some more revenue into the system, you can start thinking about how to reorganize the agencies um, and sort of longer term bigger ideas. Um, like for example, New York City um, owns the streets, manages the streets, but the MTA runs the buses. I don't know, there's a possibility for something you could you could think about long term. Does that make a lot of sense? Well, I don't, I don't know, um, for the next 30 years. Um, additionally, when it comes to climate change and sort of the coastline, we have a, a, there's something like 750 different municipalities in the region we look at, one is, which is New York City, and the coastline hits a lot of them. And we don't have any entity that's, deal, plan, that's supposed to deal with climate change and how the coast is going to change and talking to their neighbors about you know, how, that, how that's going to affect um, them as municipalities over the next 30 to, to 50 to 100 years. So those types of things we have to start thinking about now because the, if you don't change government and you don't change regulations, then you get into a situation like we're seeing now with some of the transportation changes that, where the, that's being led by the private sector. Um, and really, you want the government to lead the way and the private sector to work together and not, the, not to have this sort of battle going on. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. So you know, I'll give a little bit of a different perspective. So you know, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with the BQX. Um, but I don't know if you are aware of the fact that uh, someone in our community um, Jed Walentis, whose uh, father was a pioneer who created Dumbo and really led to the technology evolution here in Brooklyn and all the companies that are here um, in the borough. He, he's made this his personal mission. He's put a phenomenal amount of time and money behind it. Um, and it looks like it's going to happen. Um, and a continuation of that thought is if you look at Domino Park and what Two Trees has done versus the parks that are controlled by the city along the waterfront, it's a statement, no, no disrespect intended, because we love Benjamin and we love our councilman, Steve Levin. It's a statement about sometimes what the private sector can do where the public sector fails. The parks on the waterfront, some, and it's a mishmash of state control and city control, are horrible. And Domino Park, I mean, if you haven't been, you should go. It's beautiful. It's well-maintained. It's safe. It's well-lit. It's an example of what needs to happen across the board, um, improving the entire spotty park along the, the waterfront here in Williamsburg. So, you know, I think we need to think about companies like Lime, you know, and other private sector potential solutions. I mean, one of the problems with the subway, and, and I, I do think, you know, I'm not an expert on government, you know, just watching this, I can only imagine how big a mess the MTA is. Um, you know, maybe there is room to bring in a private sector company to try to solve some of these problems because it's not one; it's like 50 different pro or 61, you know, different pro different problems. And you know, historically, not just in this city but in the country, you know, if you think about what would have happened if we set up a task force to solve the situation with taxis in this city, it would have taken 100 years. Introduce Uber with a smart business plan, you know, good lobbyists, you know, 
there is room for limitation and control which the city's putting into place. But Uber has changed the nature of transportation by car for all of us. I'm a single mom. My life was really difficult until Uber was introduced. Um, that's a perfect example of the private sector fixing and correcting an industry. And there was a huge monopoly. Taxi medallion prices made no sense. There was disrespect to the customer. And all that's gone away. So I think there has to be a more, you know, not commenting on the city's lawsuits with Uber and, and Lyft. I'm not involved in the details. I do agree that there's maybe too many Ubers at this point. But there's a way to bring in sometimes private sector solutions. Um, and here in our community, all you need to do is walk down the waterfront and look at the city and state-owned parks on North 8th, North 9th, and then walk to Domino Park. And you see there the result of a private sector taking control of the process well, and, and it working. So well, kudos, I Lime, and I, I'll go. I'm going to have to head out to for Aqua. I'm a big uh, city bike user. It's, I think it'll be. We need more of that. We need more options. Well, my favorite, my favorite privatized New York City transit factoid is that George Steinway of Steinway Pianos owned a tunnel under the East River at one point, which was still maybe the strangest thing that's ever happened in New York City transit. Um, well, going to going speaking of the private sector and speaking of um, you know speaking of uh, uh, Uber and uh, and the taxis, of course, there are, you know we didn't get congestion pricing passed. Those of you who've been here before know that we had an event this summer on congestion pricing. We had a participant today from one of the Urban X cohort companies, Clear Road, was here. Um, and you know, and raising the question of like, how will we pay for our subway overhaul and repairing this? Congestion pricing has been a dominant theme. My state senator, Jessica Ramos, is leading the charge. She was grilling the MTA today uh, in public hearings on a number of issues in this. And, um, and I'd love to hear Phil and, and Benjamin and maybe Rodrigo touch upon this. Um, it's been interesting to see, I would say two points in this. One I think comes up is, I think I saw there was a New York Post piece on this at least. I didn't read the full proposal personally. But Cuomo said, sure, we can do congestion pricing, but it's going to be done by the Triborough Commission, raising the ghost of Robert Moses himself. Um, and that and that the city will have no control over it. DOT will have no control over it, which Kate can get to as well. I, I want to make some corrections to you. Okay. Well, this is the this is the New York well this is the New York Post story, so we'll get to that. But I thought it was fascinating. They'd run it through that, and then also it comes up, and then we hear this from Lyme too, is that in many cities, you know, um, you know, cities that got, won't get fooled again by letting Uber and Lyft run roughshod have also put on very punitive fees on 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 Lyme as well. So it raises some questions about okay, well. How are we going to sort of pay for this, and, and how can we tap into some of these modes? Because there was a lot of discussion today about mobility as a service, that you know, an M the MTA or a private company working with the MTA would create one app to rule them all, to bring the public and private together and profit on it. There were some ideas like that floated, but but yeah, I'd love to hear some thoughts, you know, on in retrospect of you know the congestion pricing model, since that is a Uber X uh, uh, mainstay here. But Kate, go I, I, first. I want, I want thanks. If you so want to the, fact the, check me, I go want, ahead. I, I'm fact checking you. So the MTA has a, a, an entity called the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority. So if you drive through um, the Midtown Tunnel or any of the other, the Battery Tunnel, any of the other tolled facilities, that's the entity that manages those facilities and collects the tolls. So in, in some ways, it actually makes sense for any congestion pricing revenue to go to that entity, because then it can be invested back into the MTA system. Yeah, it, was the, it was a larger point where we can install any equipment you want, and the New York City has very little control over it. I well, OK. Quality. But if the mayor is going to not say anything about it and not say he supports it, then you know he, he's, he, it got him in the game. So. There you go. Uh, well, Phil, if you want to go first, I'm curious. I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, people people have seen, you know, micro. I'm curious, like your stance on how micro mobility can fit into this and being a partner to the city, versus, yeah, aggressively asserting your rights in the city, and also how you deal with the pricing on that. Of course. So uh, when we go into any city or any market, we supply the platforms, we do the infrastructure at no cost to the city. One because it's dock free, so you don't have to put in docks that can take up parking spaces, take up streets. We can actually go in, work with whatever entity is like the New York City DOT, and figure out ways of one, connecting communities, two, putting in hotspots so we know that people are traveling to these locations to make sure that we're connecting communities very quickly, and that's reliable. But also what we do is, is that, and we have done this before, and it's something that we would think about doing in, um, in New York, is having a fee uh, that is applied per ride. So we've done that in other places where we see ourselves as being partners with the city. We're not taking something, we wanna give something, but also support infrastructure changes. Because we know that the more people are adhering to a shared streets model, the more people feel safe on bikes, they're not gonna be riding on uh, sidewalks, right? They're not gonna be breaking traffic laws because they feel protected, they have a secure infrastructure that gets them from point A to point B and even to C. 
And that's where we see ourselves coming in and hopefully helping cities transform themselves. A, qu a quick secondary question for you there, because you know, thinking of three examples, I mean, the, uh, the MTA traditionally was independent companies for profit, partly why our system is so strange. Um, and then of course, you know, you had the, in the mid-century of the GM streetcar conspiracy where the automakers, you know, basically tore out some infrastructure and subsidized others. And then, you know, Lime, I don't know your status on this, but Bird made a splash with uh, the Save Our Streets Challenge where they were going to subsidize, uh, you know, dedicated bike lanes, which I think they've pedaled back on, so to speak. But I'm curious, like, yeah, do you, do you imagine that we're gonna have a micromobility funded wave uh, of, you know, somewhat subsidized, but also pressuring cities to do this, spending your life? I would hope so, but a lot of that's gonna come from the people who are using them, right? So it's the community, it's the constituents. And education is always key. So when we're pushing anything within any given community, we're partnering with local businesses, local community activists who've been there for decades. They understand the way their communities work. We're not coming in and telling them what to do with our platforms. We're asking them what they can do with our platforms, which is something completely different. So when we're going there and we're really trying to figure out, okay, how are we connecting? How are we putting more on the ground? How are we rising ourselves to scale without causing clutter? All that comes from you. So you tell us where you need it, where it should go, and you inform your elected officials of that, right? Your borough presidents, your elected city council members, your state representatives, your state senators. Those are all of the ways that we actually build true shared streets models. Because to be honest with you, the reason why the, the Protect Our Streets Challenge didn't work, putting in bike lanes without support is very, very expensive, right? And the idea that we don't have the people backing that infrastructure change, it's not gonna get done because it's not seen as a priority. But we already know that for people to feel safe and not ride on sidewalks, they have to have the protected infrastructure. Yeah, so there's limits to that. Well, I wanna, I wanna go, we're all, we have about 15 minutes left. I wanna ask Rodrigo a question, and then I've got a lightning round exercise, and then I'm gonna open up to audience questions. But Rodrigo, I feel like a lot of this conversation has been focused on you know, the here and now, because we're temporal creatures. But again, we have this sort of, you know, Forum for the Future is very focused, of course, on sustainability, decarbonization, these big picture questions. We know from the IPCC report and the National Climate Action Report that we have a very limited amount of time. And I'm curious, you know, the, the, the exercise we went through today about you know, focusing on that we repair a major sustainable form of transport so that people don't leak into less sustainable modes was one of the big themes of this. And I'm curious, like, you know, what does is, what is the L train but, you know, sort of shut down tell us about our efforts to, to battle against that tide and, and to really decarbonize our economy in a dozen years, which is effectively what we have yeah. at most? Yeah, no, great question. Just very briefly on congestion pricing. I live in Mexico and London before, and congestion pricing actually leads into congestion cycling. There was nothing better in London to actually cycle around and really kind of explore the city in a different way. And being a little bit more serious about it, I think New York, we're late. Congestion pricing, I mean, I was speaking yesterday with Amsterdam officials, and they're already actually putting policy where they're removing 10,000 cars over the next few years, parking spaces. You know, on the streets, and that, that's kind of the next level. So I think for cities like these ones, we, we have to move a lot faster in terms of how people move in the city, what, what do we need? So in, in terms of thinking, thinking long-term, and could you summarize your question again? Because I well, kind I of the, forgot. The, I, guess, I guess the, lar the larger <laughs> question is, what is, what is, the, what is the, L, the L train shutdown and then reversal? Tell us about this, and also the time frame yeah. of this. Because again, as I mentioned, I mean, it's, it's been six and a half years since Sandy. Yeah. of this and you know you know i'm curious in, in the work of the forum for the future you know where are you seeing the capacity building and the institutional capacity to really affect these changes because this doesn't make me optimistic based totally on the yeah. trade. i think quite secretly just between you and us and uh, the audience <laughs> listening at home and the camera uh, no i think what i was actually really interested of if you think about it from a scientific perspective what it was going to happen with the shutdown it was going to for forced 225,000 people to move differently. 225,000 people are almost like the size of Pittsburgh, moving from Brooklyn to Manhattan every day. And for us, from thinking long-term, thinking about all these different issues around climate, et cetera, what I was thinking is, what can we test and what can we learn of how New York can move differently and how we interact in the city to really test how we are going to reduce congestion, how we are going to reduce CO2 emissions, air pollution, increased social well-being. So there's a lot of data in terms of research that's happening in Europe where people, when they walk to work, when they actually can interact with their space in a different way where they can actually sit down and enjoy their city, 
social well-being increases, which is kind of a benefit for health, but also economic impact for the businesses, the local businesses, actually also increases. And that's something that many people question and challenge here. Almost here is like being a, 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 a big question around using the car or using vehicles in that way. But there is data that's happening in other parts of the world. And for me, what I was thinking is, what if we actually can test that through that particular situation and learn and start to see if we can replicate 14th Street or Grand Street, which was the original plans where we were going to have buses, where we're going to have bike lanes, to interact differently with the city and perhaps a little bit better and faster and move faster within the city. Could I just, yes, go ahead. Yeah, can I, yes. I want to just, <clears throat> just say uh, uh, the whole situation with the L train, I think recently is government at its worst and maybe what it should be in some ways. I mean, at its worst, I think it's, you know, it's also an example of a, a decision being made with no public input behind closed doors. You know, Cuomo had his idea. I don't want to get into his psyche. God, that's a horrible place to be, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, he had met with the experts. He got some people in a room. He talked. They met. They kind of spent a couple of weeks, and they came up with this new plan, you know, <laughs> after years of community engagement and, and discussion. And, um, basically saying we don't, we don't need that. But, you know, but he also did go to an outside source. They looked at global ide ideas from around the globe. They've looked at new ideas that, that I think will be beneficial. I wish they had continued past the basic construction methods. I mean, you know, the, the racks that they're gonna put the, the cables on and the fixing of the bench wall, new innovative ideas that made the shutdown not, pos not necessary. Uh, there's still a lot of questions in that area, but then they stopped and they're like, okay, that's it. As, as, as Kate has said and Rodrigo and other people here, they, they need to keep pushing it and looking for, you know, the panel discussion today or the workshop today was fantastic with lots of ideas from, that I don't hear on a regular basis, that the council doesn't hear. Uh, we need to keep opening up the doors for those, for those voices. All right, so quick lightning round here, and Kate may be excused in this because the RPA has many, many, many ideas in this, but I'd love to hear from each of the panelists sort of your far-fetched or secret idea or fantasy of sort of how you would fix the L train, replace the L train, do something around it, uh, and go from there. And I'm, I'm happy to start with mine. Um, I, I guess I borrowed an idea that I proposed to the Port Authority, which was in the future, if you don't build tunnels across the Hudson, we're gonna need to convert the Holland Tunnel into basically a virtual uh, bus tunnel and terminal. And Canal Street, we'd ban it to traffic, we would road price it, we would assign lanes, and basically buses would just drop people at the Canal Street subway lines before going over the Manhattan Bridge to the Dumbo employment districts. And we would have to implement all sorts of measures, much more complicated than just building a tunnel. Um, so perhaps we would do the same thing for the Williamsburg. We'd close it off to car traffic, turn it into basically a pure bus bridge, and eventually autonomous buses would you know, accelerate uh, how many buses we could squeeze through the bridge at one time to compensate for that. So you can't probably do crazier than that, but I would love to hear, we'll start with Phil, because I'd love to hear about, you know, again, uh, for, for short trips, scooters are incredible and, they're, and will evolve very quickly. Um, but yeah, as part of a larger system, as part of dealing with the rivers, and particularly, you know, how do you see micromobility and line being part of it? Well, we see it as providing an immediate solution. I mean, we're seeing uh, people's commute times going through the roof, and scooters and e-bikes can cut that in half. I mean, if you're going 15 miles per hour, and you can ride a bike for up to 37 uh, miles, that really covers a lot of territory. But for us, it's really connecting people to that first mile, last mile, right? So once you get to your community, how are you getting through uh, that three mile radius, really around any given transportation hub? That's where we see micromobility coming into play, and that's where we see the innovation in tech. I can tell you this, look, we're on our 3.0, which is right here, plug, plug, and um, it's- uh, Snuck that up there. I had to, right? And it's, but it's our newest, most rugged version of scooter, and we built that ourselves. And that's the eighth scooter that we've built in 18 months. So that shows you that there are so many new forms of technology out there that we're incorporating into this way of mobility that no one else is really exploring yet. And the more that we look at these options, the more we integrate them into our traditional forms of transit, the better off we're gonna be. Because if people are using this for two to three miles and not getting in a car, that lowers congestion, they're able to move a lot faster and quicker, and they're able to get to their destination. That's what we see ourselves doing. So we're not taking anything away from anyone, we're just adding another option. And we hope that it can be a sustainable and true option for them. Thank you. Toby, what happens after we sell the MTA to Uber? <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that, but I will give you my, my solution is bring more jobs to Brooklyn and Queens. Um, you know, I think it's terrible what happened 
with Amazon. I don't shop on Amazon. I have a lot of issues with them as a, as a company, but it would have been transformational to bring that level of business into Long Island City, which is technically in Queens, but is like eight minutes away from us here in Williamsburg. Um, the subway in one direction is basically empty. Could you imagine if we pulled people from Manhattan to Long Island City and into Williamsburg to work? You know, 25 Kemp, but there are other buildings around us. Um, and then deeper in the L, you know, Bushwick and East Williamsburg is now becoming a center of business. So I think for me the solution is, is change the dynamic of what a commute means in the city. We have an empty subway line running from Manhattan into Brooklyn on the opposite, sort of the reverse commute that Miriam comes in. Um, you can tell us how many empty seats there are. We need to bring more people from Manhattan into Brooklyn to work and into, into parts of Queens. Um, and continue to draw, draw, uh, drive and grow companies here in this borough. Um, you know, the outer boroughs need to be a place where you can live and work, and that's going to be a phenomenal impact. Um, you know, Robert Moses and the whole system, it was all, I live in Queens and I have to drive to work to Brooklyn. It's impossible to come with the subway. You know, you have to basically ride through the whole city. So we need to think about interborough transportation, and that is also, in my view, all about jobs in the outer boroughs and no longer forcing people to go into Manhattan only to conduct their work life. We're gonna host our next event on the G. The G is, uh, that's the one we need to save. Benjamin. Lengthen, lengthen the G. Um, I, well, I just wanna echo what Toby said. I think we've talked about this a lot recently. You know, we live in a, in a borough that is a global brand. Uh, a friend of mine went to China with his kid recently and he was one place like, why does everybody here wear Brooklyn t-shirts? You know, people come here because of the area that we're in. It's nightlife. It's an amazing place. We want people to come here to work. We want people in Manhattan to come here to work. We want businesses to open up here so that, yes, they can, there'll be less commuting. I also want to put in a plug for um, not only um, uh, uh, ferries for commuters, but also freight. You know, we can, we can bring a lot of freight back and forth and shave you know, an hour of time, if, especially from New Jersey, you come across the harbor into Brooklyn, you can do small loads. You know, we're not talking, uh, you know, the, the uh, container ships, but small load to get those trucks off the road. And then you save an hour of coming around and over the bridge. So um, uh, commuter ferries and freight ferries. We have an amazing waterway. We are on islands. Let's put it to use. Excellent. Rodrigo. Nice. I just want to make a quick question. Who knows here the average speed of a bus in New York? 10 miles? Seven. 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 Sorry? 12. 12. Well, that was ambitious. No, well, essentially, I was, I was in an event la last weekend with transportation alternatives. They were saying that it's in between four and five miles per hour. So essentially, you can run faster. No, and there Scoot, are actually scooting is, is much faster. Yes. They're doing a race the bus event tomorrow. They're a race event tomorrow. So if you want to go, go and follow 14th them. 14th Street. And, and, and the reason here, well, I think going going to the, the solutions question, Greg, right, it's just like, it's a little bit to a fault. And what if, if we have a better solution that has been tested in some other parts of the world that is going to be faster, what if actually we have, rather than a 15, 18 months uh, intermittent work, what if we have a three month shutdown, a six month shutdown, and so we repair it, we make it fast, and we create protected bus lines and protected bike lines. So therefore actually people can move and we can move a little bit faster than you four miles per hour. double deckers, by the way. And double, double deckers. deckers, exactly. Uh, that's mine. Excellent, and Kate, you are excused if you choose, but if you have a I, top secret idea that didn't make the fourth regional it's, plan. It's not top secret and it did make the fourth regional plan, um, but it's a, uh, it's a new uh, passenger rail service along an existing rail freight line that runs from Bay Ridge through Flatbush and up into Queens and, and eventually into the Bronx, and it's called the Triborough Line. Um, it, the right of way is there. Um, the, there's a, like one or two freight trains that run on it every day, so let's use it for people too. Does that run on Morgan Avenue? Yes, it runs well, up. As, as, a, as a Jackson Heights resident, I support that plan. Thank uh, you. We have about seven minutes left for questions after that, so let's take some questions. I see one in the back, eager hand right there, please, sir. I don't know if we have mics or not, but we just shout it out for now. So basically, we don't talk about fair enough. 
the New Yorkers do more than um, parents. And we talk about repairs and all these things. And I'm trying to be real with you. Even when I'm catching a one train going out for somewhere like the Bronx, I can't hear what the fuck they're saying on the Jesus <laughs> at all. So when we talk about real you tell me nothing. What is the fair height going to? And is it necessary to hear a uh, 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 like I got to be real with you, 100%. Like, if, you know, this whole Elsham family thing, it sucks for everyone in this fucking world, no matter if you believe it or not. And, and honestly, it's going to suck for other New York people who live here because that's going into our fair life. I, I love down the front, too. Like, I got to that bit. Like, I can't even get back to my, my, my area. You know, it's, it's a fair life necessary. You know? Can I can I take Yeah, Kate. Okay. I Sorry. Say, I, like I would say like I would say this is why Kate's here is like, you know, uh, you know, I I will be forthright in the sense of, you know, for obvious reasons, DOT and the MTA were very reluctant to speak on the record publicly. And Kate was extremely game to represent a very large regional entity that has grappled with these issues. And so Kate is the designated flat catcher. I, and line. I am I not I am it. not the government. I yes. was the government, but She's I am no not longer. The government now. Um, but today the MTA said that if we don't pass congestion pricing, it could result in a 27 to 30, over 30% 30 fare increase additionally on top of what's already planned because they'll need that much more money um, for the, the capital improvements, which are like the, the construction projects to maintain the system. So I think your opinion on the fare, everyone's opinion on the fare hike is different. Um, you know, it, it, the, the, Honestly, it's the overall service. Yeah. I think if you got more for this, if you got more for the service, you and you understood what what the money was being used for, I think you'd be less concerned about the fares going up. We've also supported the notion of fair fares, which is now a program. It's gone into effect. It needs to be expanded. But the idea there is that for low income New Yorkers, they can get a discounted metro metro card. I'm not saying I'm not saying about the overall fare going up. I'm saying. I I think a lot of people would agree with you. <laughs> I would say you're no one. No one is just. We. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question, but I say no. I don't think anyone's really disagreeing with this, and I think you raise a really excellent question too, which I would think about as well about whether we risk a death spiral of escalating fares and declining service or declining, uh, you know, uh, uh, perceptions of service, where the whole system continues to get worse. So, thank you for raising that because I think that's exactly what we run the risk of. So, we want another question. There was one here. I, I'd like you and then you too. So, if you can get a, I don't know if you have a mic coming, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So I've been to other cities as well. Um, places like Mexico City, where it's five pesos to ride an incredible subway. Um, you know, we've talked about the MTA subsidizing the bus system and how you wanted to build potentially, um, you know, bus lanes is what they're called in England. Um, if, if they're intertwined and there's a, a restriction on budgets for transportation, how can we then improve the bus services um, and then what is the MTA doing for sustainability? I know that we use these plastic oil reliant um, metro cards that are flimsy. When are we going to update into where everybody else is updated with the magnetic systems? Rodrigo, I'm designating you. <laughs> uh, I really don't have an answer to what is happening with that payment system. But I also lived in London and, and, and Mexico City. I'm originally from Mexico City. I. I'm with you. It's, I love the system. Can you believe it? Five pesos. That's how much is that? Like that's a quarter of a dollar. It's just like, and the system is fantastic. Although the flip side of that is, transport for London is one of the highest fare systems in the world. Yes. So therefore, one and, of the most expensive. And you have different regions, and it's, it's by distance. So it depends where you're traveling. So you you actually get a different fare, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, I I think. Um, I think, yeah, on the NTA and, and that question, I, I really don't know. But I think there are different models that are happening and they work pretty well. Uh, and in London in particular, I think the system of how it's working, even just in the accessibility and the speed, how people get into the subway is way faster because you just have the tapping system. Back. Yeah, and um, I think the two tie together because I, you know, I think the L L London system is is easier it's it's more user friendly but it's it's a more sophisticated payment system that's tied to, to distance 
And I think that that's something which I'm sure you, I'm going to have to read your, look at your website, but I'm sure that's been addressed. Putting in a more sophisticated payment system They're looking that's into tied to your transportation you know, destination would, would, I think, play a role overall in improving the overall service because it's horrible. And Don't just to add in, right, train. just really quickly, just to add in from the tech innovation side, I, I kind of feel like everyone is just talking to the same people about solutions when there are a lot of companies and innovators who are out there across the world building these solutions right now. Smart cities is something that should be here in New York. We are the, or are one of the progressive bastions of the world. And we need to be thinking forward about that type of new ability for us to iterate what we're already been doing. I feel like everyone's kind of talking about the same thing over and over again and trying to apply old solutions to new problems. I mean, there are now strong tech innovative, way, tech innovative ways of really solving these things in the present and bringing in people to kind of supplement those. And we haven't done that yet. And I think that's something we should really look into doing. All right, we have one more question here and then we'll try to get to one more after that. So you, sir, right here, go ahead and shout it out. Um, all right, thanks guys for coming. Really awesome talk. Um, I consider myself one of the 40% of the people who lost out to my event because my fiance made me move to Manhattan. Sorry, dude. Oh, I know. Um, <laughs> Welcome to Brooklyn. Yeah, I'm just moving from here for a few um, One of the things that Rodrigo really got me thinking about was about the paradigm shift and the thinking towards the future and how to get people to do that. And I read the fourth plan. When it came out, I thought it was super nifty, at least as much as I could get through it. Um, but I would be willing to bet that most of my peers did not, and they're not willing to sift through something that's dense, that's not right in front of their face. And so one of the things that's really hard to do is to get people to think about the future, and to think about making the world better and the city better for 100 years from now. So uh, my question was kind of for Kate, and is how does the RPA go about making things digestible and making things relatable so that people can begin to say, maybe we can get on board with some of these changes because we want to see the better for the future. Well, we need everyone's help to do that. Um, we have sort of we have our uh, committees in each of the states that gather, and we have an emerging leaders group um, that is helping us, a younger generation of folks coming up who are really engaged in our issues. So, if you're interested in any of that, let me know. Um, but we really need your help. I mean, we we are we're like policy wonk nerds. I mean, we need help on social media. We need help from marketing people. We need that sort of help to get us to be able to better communicate to a wider audience. Just a quick addition to that, sorry, Ben. Just um, one of the things, one of the tools that we, we use, and this is the designer in me, we need imagination. We, and with imagination, I mean, we need to create the visuals or the models or the prototypes or the pilots that are showing that new model. Just to suspend this belief and to really kind of move a little bit closer towards the, the kind of system that we imagine. And that involves different levels of uh, design approaches. That involves rapid prototyping. That involves like you creating a, a new model that samples that. But I think the key one for me there, uh, and from a kind of high level perspective, is the imagination is, is needed to build that on the policy, to build that in planning expertise, to build that on the legal aspects. It's, it's kind of, you need a conglomerate of answers rather than a massive answer. When you think of the, have you seen the Ford like, virtual reality thing at Oculus? Quite techy. <laughs> well, people. I'll say that one. Then we're going to end this because we're eating into our open bar time at this point. People, um, <laughs> is that as they pointed out, is, this, is a number of technology companies, OEMs. I mean, with the fact that we're here at ADO, Urban X, Mini, and part of BMW Group have just created a joint venture with Daimler to advance these kind of solutions. So there's a lot of companies. Uh, you know, Peugeot in France is going to bring back Free to Move, which is already doing this kind of mobility as a service. And I'll, and I'll conclude here because. The final solution that the workshop came up with was basically a sort of different pieces of this about we need open, AEI, open APIs to pull data out of the public and private ones so we can combine it all together. We need to build a mobility as a service brand and be able to sell this to someone. And, we, and then I was part of one where like we need to build new predictive engines because you know what if we understood more granularly demand and understood how peaks change throughout the day and are changing by neighborhood so we could start actually do, you know uh, developing service more quickly ideally if we have the physical capacity. So it's really interesting like yeah like you know the the, the OEMs uh, BMW Group included are, are focusing on this. So hopefully, you know, if there is a silver lining or silverish lining, it's that you know there might be this new new age of public-private partnerships to deal with some of this. And on that, like the best hopeful note we're going to get, we're going to leave it here for now. So can I get another round of applause for our panelists? Thank you so much. Thank you, Urban X. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Greg.